students, I will typically start the subsequent lecture with a review from the previous class. And so I'd like to review really quickly some things about white blood cells. So we had a term called leukocytosis. And so if you saw that in a patient's chart, can you kind of try and think in your head or you can write it down if you want to. You don't have to send anything to me. Can you remember what leukocytosis meant? So that term cytosis. Is this an increase in white blood cells? Is it an increase in leukocytes or lymphocytes? So we had a specific type of cell called the lymphocyte that was a white blood cell. Leukocytes was the term to mean all white blood cells. So the total white blood cell count is increased if I see the term leukocytosis in a patient's chart. What did it mean? Can you remember what it meant if you had a shift to the left? What does that mean there's an increase in? So you should remember, if I have a shift to the left, it means there was an increase in bands. The thing that that's important about, or I guess the reason that's important clinically is, it means usually an acute infection, one that's within the last three to five days, or that's ongoing. And a shift to the left typically is associated with, because it's neutrophils, a bacterial infection. If we give you antibiotics, we should see the band count decrease. The band count can also decrease because those bands are going to grow up and become SEGs or segmented neutrophils. We have a little case study here then. So we have a 20-year-old patient who has marked eosinophilia. So what does that term mean? Now we're talking about eosinophils and eosinophils were a type of white blood cell when we did the differential we had. Neutrophils were the most common, then lymphocytes, then basophils and monocytes and eosinophils were kind of the lesser players in the white blood cell community. But this person has increased eosinophilia. So do you remember that if lymphocytes went up, we usually think viral infection. If we have neutrophils go up, SEGs or bands or both, we think about bacterial infection. Monocytes elevate typically with a fungal infection and eosinophils go up if you have, can you fill in that blank? If you can't and you're going to be working in clinical, you may want to kind of review that lecture one and you'll have access to those for the entire semester so you could go back and practice. But this would mean that they probably have some sort of allergic reaction because eosinophils elevate typically with um, allergic asthma or food allergies. Uh, if you had a vaccination, you're kind of having an allergic reaction. That process, your body kind of thinks that same way. Here's a gentleman who has a very elevated white blood cell count. So I didn't ask you to memorize normals, but we said white blood cells was an easy one to remember. Five to 10,000 is normal. This person has lymphopenia, or another way to write that would be lymphocytopenia. So of these 40,000 white blood cells total, a lot of them are lymphocytes. Not leukocytes, lymphocytes. So they do have a leukocytosis, an increased total white blood cell count, but they also have a lymphocytosis. Oh, I keep saying cytosis. They have a penia, so they have very few lymphocytes. We could worry about the low white blood cell count. Um, there is a type of leukemia called lymphocytic leukemia. And that's what we worry about in a patient who has this really high white blood cell count. If they don't have signs of infection somewhere, we wonder why, are there, why is their bone marrow producing so many white blood cells. So if you had a patient who had a lot of white blood cells like this, we'd be looking at have they had recent surgery and maybe do they have an abscess. We'd look to see um, do they have symptoms of infection like a fever. Have they been ill? Do they feel ill? Feel Ill? And um, if we had lymphocytopenia that went with it, we might also explore that possibility that maybe they have leukemia. My lab report says the white blood cell was corrected for NRBC. So do you remember we talked about, or I talked about, how a computer could be taught to recognize a white blood cell from a red blood cell? 
and we looked at a slide that showed red blood cells don't have a nucleus, but white blood cells do. Well, this one says there were some nucleated red blood cells, and because there were a, was a nucleus, the computer counted them as a white blood cell when really they're a red blood cell. So if they've corrected, the white blood cell count is going to drop because they will have subtracted out those ones that were really red blood cells instead of white blood cells. So if your white blood cell count is elevated, they're always going to have somebody, a person, check to see if there were nucleated red blood cells. All right, here is a CBC. This is the one that's more what it looks like when it's on a computer screen. Let's orient ourselves to what we're seeing. I'm seeing the laboratory test over here. A CBC includes white blood cell count, information about the red blood cells, information about the platelets, and it included a differential as well. So we do have some nucleated red blood cells. They corrected that. Can you see it says corrected, corrected, or comment, excuse me, comment one, comment two, comment three, and they're doing those here. These are columns as far as time. And you can see that these are bolded on my computer screen in the clinical site. These would be a different color typically too. They're usually red. I could click on that and see normals for that value. So I could click on this and it would tell me that the normal value for white blood cells at this facility is something like five to 10,000. So we have, let's see if we can put together a story just based on the white blood cell count. We have elevated white blood cell count. It is falling, but it's still elevated above its normal range. So is the person getting better? That's one explanation that as antibiotics work, as we drain your abscess, as we find that source of infection and try and do something to treat it, we should see your bone marrow recognize that it doesn't have to pump out as many white blood cells. The other scenario could be, does this mean you're getting worse? That we haven't been able to find it and now your bone marrow is saying, I can't keep up anymore. So both of those are possibilities. Let's go to the differential and it reported the numbers to us two ways. It gave us a percentage and it reports them as actual numbers. The way that they did that was they took, this is 82% of 2,400 cells if I take 0.82 because I make it a decimal times 20,400, I end up with 16,800 cells. You remember these decimals don't mean that there's 16.8 cells. They expected that you remembered that either this TH or K means 1,000. So we have white blood cells present in the 1,000. There are 16,000 of those 20,000 cells that are neutrophils. There's a certain percentage that's banned. So let me tell you how these are abnormal. We've already talked about this one that's very elevated above the normal level. The neutrophils are less than they should be. Do you remember that in a normal healthy body, these represent about 40 to 75% of the total white blood cell? So these are low. So that's kind of ironic, isn't it? Oh, excuse me, you know what? These aren't percentages. <laughs> See, even I can get screwed up. I wish I had that men in black pen thing sometimes so I could say, hey, forget that last thing I just said. If I'm looking at the percentages, and that's how come I knew I was like, wait a minute, you can't have this really elevated white blood cell count and not have these be elevated. So here is an elevation above that like 75% threshold in our neutrophils. Here's our bands. Bands should be about 3 to 5% of the total, so our band count was elevated. Those bands then grew up and became segmented neutrophils. So over time, look at this, this is almost 24 hours, these baby bands grew up and became SEGs. And they do that pretty quickly, or they became full-size neutrophils. So sometimes the lab will say SEGs. Sometimes they just say neutrophils and they expect that you know that's the mature one and the band ones, bands are the immature one. The next thing we're going to do is look at the lymphocytes. The lymphocytes are low, so I could say, well, am I worried about the low one or am I worried about the high one? And we spoke about this last lecture. I talked about relative and absolute. It's more likely that the body responds appropriately and releases white blood cells. So we're going to assume here's what happened. Because the neutrophils and band neutrophils are increased, because these have to total 100, that means one cell count 
or the next most common cell count is probably going to decrease. So do you remember that lymphocytes were the next most common cell type of white blood cells? So our lymphocyte is decreased relative to because of the increase in neutrophils. And then we have our little basophils here within their normal limit. Our monocytes are within their normal limits and they didn't even measure any eosinophils. But you can tell the normal for these would be like 0 to 5. So those are all okay. When we come to the actual cell counts then we'd expect these are going to be elevated. We saw those bands grow up and become SAGs. And because we're dealing with a smaller percentage now, or excuse me, a smaller total now, we have lower cell counts. So I would say the band count is coming down. That could mean that the body is not responding appropriately and it's losing the battle for infection. We're going to hope that because these lab tests were from a hospital, they're because the body senses that we're doing something to help it. We've given the antibiotics. We've taken out that inflamed uh, colon or whatever was wrong with the patient. This week we're going to focus on the red blood cells and what's called the red blood cell indices. Just like we had indicators, these things, about the white blood cells, we have some tests that tell us more information about the red blood cells. So this is red blood cell count. This is hemoglobin and hematocrit. So we'll start, I'll start the lecture by talking about those things. But then I'm going to move to some tests that if you ask people in the hospital, a lot of people may not know what these are. They may say, oh, I learned about them in school and I don't remember what they do. But they basically give us more information about the red blood cell. If you're familiar with the term mean, M-E-A-N, not like mean type of cell, not like the bully cells of the body, but average, this is average corpuscular or cell volume, so the average volume of the red blood cell. The red site or red cell distribution width or red blood cells are called reticulocyte, so reticulocyte distribution width. It tells me about the width of a red blood cell and I bet you can remember in high school biology or anatomy talking about diseases that change the shape of a red blood cell like sickle cell anemia. There are other ones but that seems to be a common one. Mean cell hemoglobin. So the average amount of hemoglobin that's on a red blood cell and mean cell hemoglobin concentration, um, I guess in relationship to all of the other hemoglobin or cells that are the other red blood cells, how much is this one carrying of that overall hemoglobin concentration? So they kind of look similar and if you look the results are kind of similar too. All right. So let's practice kind of putting some pieces together. So I have another CBC here. Let's look at your white blood cells. They've given you the normal range here and here's this person's white blood cells. So initially we can see this pattern after surgery. When they do surgery there's inflammation. They disturb things and so a person comes in and they have an infection so their white blood cells elevated and we get a report back in a few hours and it's elevated and we say, gosh, I thought we were going to make them better. We are going to. We should hopefully, and look how quickly it did start to trend downward. Here's 2 o'clock in the morning. If you're not familiar with military time, this was 9.29 at 2 o'clock the next morning and at 6 o'clock the next morning. So we are seeing that improve. It was this little spike we might see after surgery because of that inflammation. Red blood cells. Red blood cells are present in the millions as opposed to white blood cells which were present in the thousands. We should have millions of red blood cells and they expect you know this means 4,300,000 then or 5,900,000 but look at this person. They have a really low red blood cell count and I believe this lab report was for a patient who went to surgery. So can you guess that there was some blood loss? Or I'll talk later in the lecture about how fluids, giving fluids might influence the red blood cell count and white blood cell count and platelet count. We have a hemoglobin and hemoglobin was that main component of a red blood cell so we'd expect that those things would kind of go together. So isn't it interesting you can see that when the red blood cell counts low, 
the hemoglobin count is low and the hematocrit count is low. And this tells us that the width of those red blood cells, they're a little bit wider than they normally should be. Remember this was red cell or reticulocyte distribution width. Uh, as far as the white blood cell differential, it looks like the neutrophils are low even though the total, total white blood cell count, oh shoot, I'm doing that again. I went to the numbers instead of the percentage. So here's 71% neutrophils, the mature ones, 3% bands, and that's within its normal range. So this is on the high end of normal. This is on the low value. It's less than it should be. Again, I'm not worried about the low one. I'm worried about this one. So it does indicate maybe a chronic infection because it's a, not a right shift, but I do have significant number of mature neutrophils. All they've done is manipulate the math and it is kind of interesting how you can have like this one. Look at this. The neutrophil was fine above. It was within its normal percentage, but the actual cell number. So if you're given the option, like this laboratory test, of looking at the data both percent and numbers, it's probably best to look at the numbers. Realizing though that they're all interrelated. This a percentage was used to calculate the number. They just did 71% of 14,100. So today we're going to talk about complete blood cell counts. So we're going to talk mainly about red blood cells. We'll look at a condition called anemia, a condition called polycythemia, and we'll talk about those red blood cell indices. And the last thing I'll talk about is a thing called erythrocyte sedimentation rate. So when I'm done with this lecture or when you're done listening to it, you should know more about these items. So here was our test. We're going to focus on red blood cells and here's a lab report again that I can tell they use H's and L's and asterisks if it's a panic value or a critical value. We do have a low red blood cell count and that term is anemia. When we have a low red blood cell count the name of red blood cells is erythrocyte. So I could also, as an alternate, call it erythrocytopenia. But in a hospital or in a clinical setting, it's usually more common that people would be familiar with the term anemia. When I hear that term, anemia, it means that the red blood cell count is lower than it should be. Blood is composed of a liquid part and a cellular part. And the cells that are present, if I look at this thing, it's reminding me red blood cells are present in the millions, white blood cells are present in the thousands, and then there would be platelets. So the thing they haven't labeled here is mixed in with these red blood cells, there would also be platelets. But definitely because red blood cells are present in the millions, the main solid of the blood, and I know it seems strange probably to think of something that's a liquid as having a solid component, but it does, those solids are the cells. Red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. They show this thin little layer and if I took a sample of blood and I let it settle out with some anticoagulant in it so that it wouldn't clot, it would actually kind of do this. The red blood cells and platelets would settle to the bottom and they are really kind of red in color. The white blood cells, sometimes people call it buffy coat. The color buffy is a light brown or kind of a pale tan color. And those cells are actually colored. They give that layer its coloring. So white blood cells are named that way for a reason. When someone looked at it under a microscope, they said these look white. The plasma is the liquid part of the blood. And if you go to the local plasma donation center that students are famous for visiting, they take your whole blood they filter out your plasma, which has antibodies and clotting factors in it. They give you back your red blood cells and I believe white blood cells too. I know they give you back your red ones and I believe what they're doing is separating those solids from the liquids and they're giving you the solids back. So hematocrit is a test that's reported on a CBC and hematocrit is a ratio. It's the ratio of the solids in the blood compared to the liquids in the blood. Remember those solids were red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. The liquid is the plasma. That plasma contains clotting factors. In anatomy and physiology, we talk about the factor that's responsible for hemophilia, 
So those clotting factors with Roman numerals like 1 and 8 and 10. And then we have um, antibodies that protect us against infections or if you've had a vaccination, maybe you're vaccinated against measles. To go to a clinical facility, you get a titer and those antibodies are present in your plasma. So a mathematical formula here, solids divided by liquids. So what factors would cause an increased hematocrit? Mathematically, what would I need to do to get a higher number, a higher percentage? When we do ratio calculations, we get a percentage. When I compare the ratio of solids to liquids, the label for hematocrit is a percent. So I'm going to go back here for just a minute. Look at the label for hematocrit. It's a percent. The solids compared to the liquids, the normal is your blood is about 40 to 50 percent of the solids compared to the liquids. So mainly blood is liquid with about half, a little less than half of solid. And I don't want to end the show. So I could increase the solids. That would give me a higher percentage. I could decrease the liquids and we call that dehydration. I could have a combination of the above. So let's say we have someone whose bone marrow is producing more red blood cells than it needs to, maybe because of a low oxygen level. We'll see how that all ties together in a minute. So let's say we have a person who has a disease condition that they have low oxygen in their blood, so their bone marrow says pump out more red blood cells. At the same time, they're drinking lots of fluids, or they're dehydrated in this case, so they're not drinking fluids. That would make their hematocrit very high. Both things can happen together or it may just be one happening. So what things will cause an increased hematocrit? Dehydration will or increased amounts of cells, specifically red blood cells since they were in the millions. What would cause a decreased hematocrit then? Well, it would be the opposite. So if I had a decreased hematocrit like I do here, it could be because there really are fewer red blood cells. And you can't just go, the temptation is to say, well, yeah, I knew that. The red blood cell count is right here. This is a sample of whole blood. Whole blood has solid and liquid. So I could manipulate the liquid piece and make you think that there's more or less solid. How would I do that? Well, if we wanted a high hematocrit or if I had a high hematocrit, I explained it by dehydration. What would be the explanation or one possible explanation for this person's low hematocrit then? If it was solids divided by liquids, maybe they're overhydrated. And that could happen if I came in an ambulance and the ambulance people put, um, the paramedics put an IV in me and started running fluids like crazy. Or we had patients who maybe got left on a higher dose of IV fluids than they should have. Or we have people who, because they know they're supposed to drink a little bit of water, I'll bet we've all seen someone who's hauling that gallon jug around and they're saying, yeah, I drink four of these a day when we know that the, the, a normal healthy body usually only <laughs> needs eight cups of water a day or eight eight ounce servings of water a day. So our bodies are pretty efficient with the fluid we have, but I could actually dilute my cell count down. Now, another way that that might play out clinically, let's say I'm going to go donate blood. And because I've donated blood before, I know that they always tell me, drink extra liquids before I come for my appointment. And they want me to do that because they're going to take out some of my fluid and they're not going to give me something back like the plasma center does. They're expecting I would replace my own fluids by drinking more before I came in. So what if I, in that message, heard drink lots of fluids and I drank a couple gallons of fluid before I went in for my blood donation appointment? When they do my hematocrit test to see if I have enough solids to both supply a pint for someone else and keep me alive, it could look like I have a low hematocrit. And it isn't that I have too few red blood cells, it's because I drank too many fluids and I changed that number. So you can't look at this and say, well, I'd expect the hematocrit to be low because the cell count is no. Yes, they're or low. Yes, they're related, but the state of hydration affects all of these test results because it's done on a sample of blood. So when I have this in the clinical, I look at the results of the test, but I also know has that patient gained a lot of weight that would represent fluid.
or did they look really dehydrated? I pinched the skin above their collarbone to see if it snaps back into place, meaning good hydration, or does it stay kind of pinched up or tented? And that means they're dehydrated. I might consider the color of their urine. Is their urine really dark? When does your urine become really dark? It's when you're dehydrated. And when you're overhydrated, your urine becomes really pale. So when we look at tests that are done on blood, we also usually need to consider looking at a person's state of hydration. How well hydrated are they? So erythrocytes is the fancy name for a red blood cell. Think about where are they produced? So you can either talk to your computer, you can just think about that in your head. Where are red blood cells produced? Well, they're produced by the bone marrow. What is their job in the body? And I'll bet we can all say they're supposed to carry oxygen. And that is correct. That is their primary job in the body. They also play a little bit of a role in acid-base balance and um, other processes. What is the primary component or what is the main thing that a red blood cell is made up of? Well, an erythrocyte gets its red color from the heme, the hemoglobin. So the primary component of a red blood cell is hemoglobin, and that is the part of the red blood cell that carries the oxygen. What's the normal life expectancy of a red blood cell? Do you remember that? The normal life of a red blood cell is about 120 days. So every 120 days, not all your cells are dying at the same time, but your spleen is responsible for kind of filtering out those old blood cells and your bone marrow makes new ones. So about the life expectancy of a, of a red blood cell is about 120 days. What things control red blood cell production? So we know where they come from, but what's the mechanism for the bone marrow to make those red blood cells? And what components are needed for red blood cell production? So what things does the body have to have to build red blood cells? If you remember the term heme, it referred to iron, H-E-M-E, -E, it referred to iron. So we must need iron to make red blood cells, and I'll bet you've heard of people who have anemia because they don't have iron, they have iron deficiency. So this picture kind of shows us the mechanism and the things we need for normal red blood cell production. This is showing the process of anemia, a decrease in the amount of cells in the blood, and so that meant a decreased red blood cell count. When someone has anemia, there is low oxygen delivered to the body, because remember the main job of a red blood cell was to carry oxygen. When it can't do that efficiently or effectively, the cells get they sense that they're low on oxygen and there's a signal released and some cells that are really sensitive to that low oxygen level are the kidneys. When the kidneys sense the oxygen levels are low, they release a hormone called erythropoietin. I bet some of this is sounding familiar. When erythropoietin is released, it stimulates bone marrow production of new red blood cells and hopefully brings that back. So now I want you to think, this is so interesting to me because think if you're a competitive athlete. We just had the Olympics, and you think of where Olympic training centers are located. How are they using this process? Olympic training centers are typically located at very high altitudes, and when I go to a high altitude, what would that simulate in this picture? Well, when I go to high altitude, there's still 21% oxygen there, but there's less pressure that would start pushing my body into a hypoxia, especially if I was training significantly. Because my kidneys become hypoxemic, what do they do? They release erythropoietin. What does that cause? My body produces bone marrow. So tell me about an athlete at the Olympic Training Center, and they're working out. Guess what their body is actually doing? It's naturally producing some of its own red blood cells. Now we could do a couple things with those. The legal thing to do is you train at high altitude and your body makes its own red blood cells and then you drink fluids to kind of balance out those extra cells. This is not, they were not anemic to start with, with were they? They were simulating that anemia by going to high altitude. If I'm unethical, how do I make my body produce more red blood cells as an athlete? Well, they used to use the drug erythropoietin.
And we use erythropoietin or epoietin in the hospital, and there's some brand names for it, but the generic is epoietin. We use it to stimulate red blood cell production from the bone marrow. So for that to work, I'm going to have to have healthy bone marrow, and I'm going to give this hormone erythropoietin to you in drug form or pill form or shots. Typically, it's given in a shot. You would start to complain of achy bones, and that would mean it's working, huh? Because that would mean the bone marrow is producing those red blood cells. And then we would do a reticulocyte count. Reticulocytes are baby erythrocytes. By doing the reticulocyte count, we could tell, is that erythropoietin that we're giving you working? So isn't that kind of cool? Can you imagine how an athlete might do that too? What's the whole purpose of red blood cells? To carry oxygen. What's one of the things that would determine how much endurance you have? Well, that would be how much oxygen your cells could get. What's the way to increase that endurance? Increase the amount of cells that you have. So you could do it ethically. It's legal when they consider that you go to high altitude and you train so that your body produces its own red blood cells. But can you imagine some of those athletes then could have increased hematocrit counts? Well, they say we're going to check your blood when you come to see what your crit is. Because another way to cheat is let's give you blood cells. And instead of giving you someone else's blood cells, what if you've been at that training center for six months, five months? Um, probably less time than that because we won't want those cells hanging around that long. But let's say you've been there three months and every couple of weeks we take some of your own red blood cells from you and we store them for you. And before you go to the Olympics, we give you a transfusion of your own blood. We do that in the hospital for people if we know they're going to have a scheduled surgery. We save their blood for them. They come in and donate to themselves. It's called autologous blood donation. If I'm going to have a knee surgery and it's a scheduled procedure and I say, yeah, I'd like to have that in November, I would start going in about once a month now and donating blood for myself that would be saved. Well, that athlete could do that same thing, but when they get to the Olympic training or when they get to the Olympics, they're going to check a blood sample. And can you bet one of the things they check is crit? Could you remember how you could manipulate hematocrit? They've got too many cells. What could they do to balance that out and make the crit look the right way? I'll bet you could identify that if the person drank a lot of fluids, it would balance it all out and make it look well. Well, they used to do that. So the Olympic um, commissioners got smarter and they said, when you come for your blood test, you're also going to have to take a pee test. And if your pee is really diluted down, then we know all you did was just drink a bunch of fluids. So some ways that, and this is called blood doping, that athletes had done blood doping was either erythropoietin, their own transfusion of red blood cells, drinking a lot of extra fluids to try and kind of dilute that and make it look better, and the Olympic commissioners are trying to look at all those things and make sure that everyone plays fairly. Okay, production of red blood cells. I guess one more summary on this then. So in a hospital setting, when we do have patients who have problems with anemia, giving oxygen kind of defeats the purpose. So we do that sometimes, but look at this was kind of a helpful mechanism. When I have low red blood cell count, it was for a reason, so that my kidneys would get a little bit starved on oxygen. They would release that hormone. My bone marrow would release more red blood cells. We're going to have some patients whose bone marrow doesn't work. If I have undiagnosed bone cancer, or if I have chemotherapy or radiation therapy for known cancer, those things suppress bone marrow production. So I may not be able to, even if you gave me erythropoietin, I may not be able to grow new red blood cells. I need iron to make red blood cells. So if I don't have enough iron, and the way our body usually gets the iron to make red blood cells is it recycles them. Your spleen breaks down those red blood cells and it saves the pieces of them to build new ones. But think of a type of patient who doesn't have the ability to recycle their own red blood cells. That would be someone who had a hemorrhaging. If I hemorrhaged into my stomach, like with a bleeding ulcer, if I hemorrhaged because I had um, a major artery cut in an arm or a leg, you're not going to gather up those red blood cells and give them back to me so that I have the components of it. Those are lost to me. So you and I, we don't generally need any kind of iron supplement because we're recycling the iron in the cells that are being broken down 
and the body's just building new ones from those parts. But patients might have that problem. We need iron to build it. We need erythropoietin to make red blood cells. We need functioning bone marrow. So keep all those things in mind when we talk about the causes of anemia. And when we talk about polycythemia, think about this piece of this picture. This picture to me is really helpful to explain how this process works. So how does the body produce red blood cells? We know it comes from bone marrow. We know the pieces that go into it. We've talked about how normally before the the bone marrow releases a red blood cell, it also loses its nucleus. And so that that reticulocyte or the erythrocyte should not have a nucleus to it. A reticulocyte is a baby red blood cell. And you can see that the shape is even kind of different, but a reticulocyte shouldn't have a nucleus. All right, why is this slide important then? We will see a test done in hospitals with reticulocyte count. And reticulocytes would be to look to see if you have healthy bone marrow. We're generally going to see a reticulocyte count after we've given you erythropoietin to make sure that your bone marrow is responding correctly to that hormone. Why would I see a bunch of reticulocytes? It tells me maybe your body had low oxygen. It tells me that something's stimulating your bone marrow to do that. And sometimes those can be weird chemicals in our environment that might do that. The other takeaway message from this slide was remember that normally the way a computer is taught to recognize white blood cells and red blood cells is it's taught that red blood cells don't have a nucleus. But if the bone marrow is under a lot of pressure, it will put out some nucleated red blood cells. Okay, what's the relationship of red blood cell hemoglobin and hematocrit? We've kind of touched on this. The main component of a red blood cell is hemoglobin. And hematocrit was the ratio of the blood solids, the red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets compared to the liquids, the plasma, the clotting factors, and the antibodies. The main blood solid is red blood cells because they're present in the millions. White blood cells are present in the thousands, and platelets, when we talk about those next week, they're present in the hundred thousands. So red blood cells by far means wins. So when a patient's red blood cell count is elevated, we have more red blood cells than we should, what do you think happens to the hemoglobin? Well, logically, if hemoglobin is the main part of a red blood cell, hemoglobin would have to go up. And because hematocrit looks at the solids to the liquids and the main blood solid is a red blood cell, when red blood cell count goes up, hematocrit goes up. How might hydration affect the results? So if I have a high hematocrit, that means more liquid or less solid. Did I say that right? If I have a high hematocrit, that means, there we go, more liquid or, yeah, solid or more solids also. How might hydration affect the results? We take that sample and we do whole blood. So if I have a lot of liquid, it dilutes down the amount of, so I said that wrong. Gosh, I'm so sorry about that. Hydration, if I'm overhydrated, that makes it look like I have fewer cells. That means a lower hematocrit. If I'm dehydrated, that makes it look like the cells are more concentrated, and so it increases the hematocrit ratio. The answer to this one was easier. Red blood cell counts elevated. What do you think happens with hemoglobin and hematocrit? They go up. So red blood cells go down, hemoglobin goes down, crit goes down. Let's look at this. Here's the person who came in. Their white blood or their red blood cell count was low, and it dropped lower, and it dropped lower. We'd hope that they start to produce more red blood cells, but right now they're very anemic. The red blood cell counts low. We said their hemoglobin is going to be low, and it is. Here's the normals. And their hematocrit is going to be very low. Look how low this is compared to normal. The other thing I want to have you uh, teach you about while we have this screen up is males and females. When we look at the normal value for hemoglobin is the easiest place to see it. If I have a value that goes to the 16 or 18 range, that is a male patient. So I don't have any other identifiers on here except this. That is telling me this is a male patient. In females, because of menses is the reason they advertise, but that seems kind of ironic because we use the same lab values for someone who's gone through menopause who doesn't have menses anymore or for a young girl who may not have started.
but the normal value for hemoglobin for women is lower. Their maximum is going to be in the 14 range. So if I'm seeing a hemoglobin that goes from 12 to 14, now I'm dealing with a female. If I'm seeing one like this that goes up to the 16 range, or maybe even as high as 18, I'm dealing with a male patient. So this is a female, or excuse me, a male patient. They have anemia, and when you have anemia, we are, our hemoglobin is going to have to be low, our crit is going to have to be low. The other thing that could have caused this, though, it can make it look like you have anemia, and we would say you have anemia based on these lab results. But the other thing that could cause this is very overhydrated person. If I drank lots of fluids, that would make it look like there were less solids, even though there may be not. But that happens so rarely, we're usually safe to just say, yes, they have anemia. And maybe hydration plays into it. Okay, what's the mathematical relationship of hemoglobin and hematocrit? So look at the mathematical relationship here. Mathematically, what would I have to do with this number to get this number? Mathematically, what could I do with this number to get this number? And you can see it's pretty much divisible or multiplying 3. If I take the hematocrit and divide it by 3, it estimates hemoglobin. If I take hemoglobin and multiply it by 3, it estimates hematocrit. Let's see if it works here. Here's the hemoglobin of 5 times it by 3. That estimates crit. Yeah, it worked. If you know the crit, divide it by 3 and you can estimate hemoglobin. So why is that a value? When I go donate blood, or if you've gone and donated blood, they do a test before you ever donated, and they do a hematocrit. They take um, your finger, and they poke it, and they collect a few drops of blood, and they put it in a little machine that spins it, and that little spinner thing will tell them your hematocrit. It estimates it for it. So they take that hematocrit, divide it by 3, and estimate your hemoglobin. In clinical, sometimes we don't want to do a complete blood cell count. We just want to do a finger poke. So we may be able to get your crit and estimate your hemoglobin. In the hospital, we love to use initials. A hemoglobin and hematocrit are called an H and H. So if someone says on one of those medical shows, what's your patient's H and H? Or the patient's H and H is, they always put hemoglobin first and hematocrit second. And you would know that based on hemoglobin will always be the lower of those two numbers. Hemoglobin's always going to be about a third of your hematocrit. And if you look, it's not any, it's just kind of magical that relationship works because one's reported as percents and one's reported as grams per deciliter, which means 100 milliliters. Okay, so if on the quiz this week I say you have a patient who has a hemoglobin of 10, what is their estimated hematocrit? Well, it would be times 3, so they would probably have a, he a hematocrit of about 30. If I said you have a patient who has a hematocrit of 10, think of what their hemoglobin would be. It's only going to be down in the 3 range, so they would be extremely anemic. Usually, we use hemoglobin as a guide for when to give a patient a transfusion. And if your hemoglobin is usually less than 6 is the cutoff point we use, some places will be a little more aggressive and use a hemoglobin of 8. But most places will let your hemoglobin get clear down to 6 before they transfuse you. So it's really ironic that we saw this happen. Usually you would have seen drop, drop, give a transfusion, and then see a bump in it. So I could tell, hey, they gave a transfusion and bumped those numbers up. This is unlikely that they let it go this long that this person was that anemic. Okay, so we talked about a couple things right there. We said anytime you have a low red blood cell count, you're also going to have a low hemoglobin and a low crit. And hopefully you understand the pattern there. You can estimate your hemoglobin if you have your crit by dividing your crit by 3. If you have your hemoglobin, you could multiply it by 3 and estimate the hematocrit. Anemia is a red blood cell count below the normal range. If you use the term erythrocyte, could you tell what term you would use? So we use penia, so erythrocytopenia, but the more common thing is definitely going to be anemia. And in reference to the components needed to produce red blood cells, can you think of some of the causes of anemia? So this is types of anemia. A, plastic. Sorry, I'm going to give you a second just to find that part in your notes. <coughs> 
aplastic is a term we don't hear that often, and it's not that common of a cause of anemia. But aplastic anemia, if I'm working with chemotherapy patients, if I'm working with people who have had environmental exposure to different toxins, I might see a patient who has aplastic anemia. And that is the bone marrow is not working efficiently or you have a condition where we have suppressed the bone marrow intentionally. So aplastic, the cause of anemia is due to a lack of functioning bone marrow to produce or keep up with production of red blood cells. Hemorrhagic, I bet you could look at that term and tell me the cause of a low red blood cell in this patient. So this is going to be common in patients who've had trauma. We have patients who bleed because of bleeding ulcers or we'll talk about conditions like cirrhosis of the liver and that leads to esophageal varices and you have some blood vessels in your esophagus that rupture and they bleed. So bleeding from somewhere can cause anemia. Hemorrhagic anemia is the term we give that one. Hemolytic. So hemolysis is destruction or rupture of a red blood cell. The examples of this one would be things like RH incompatibility. So I'll bet somewhere in your training you've learned about RH positive and RH negative. And we generally don't have problems with those. We like to know what type you are, what your blood type is. But it does become a concern if we have a mother who's RH negative and they're having a second, third, fourth baby. It's usually not an issue with number one, but it is for subsequent pregnancies. If the baby has an RH positive status, then the mother's body produces antibodies against that. And so those antibodies could cross the placenta and result in the death of a baby, of the fetus. So hemolytic anemia, it's RH incompatibilities. There's another type of blood discrepancy between moms and babies called ABO incompatibility. If, if a mom has O blood and a baby has A or B blood or AB blood, there can be an incompatibility between the mom's and the baby's blood type. It's definitely less severe than the RH factor. This can happen if we gave someone a transfusion. We worry about hemolytic anemia. So when we give a person a transfusion, even if we've done good matching of those blood types, we watch them and monitor them very closely that first half hour to make sure that they don't have symptoms suspicious for hemolytic anemia. Hemolytic anemia could happen in sepsis. There are bacteria and viruses that release toxins that could destroy red blood cells. So hemolysis is rupture of blood blood cells. We're going to see it mainly in things that, that are infection in the bloodstream that, that maybe that um, infectious agent releases those toxins that target red blood cells or we're going to see it in RH incompatibilities between moms and babies or somebody who had a transfusion reaction. And they can be severe enough that they kill you. Pernicious anemia. This is a lack of vitamins and specifically the B vitamins, B12 and B6. So when we looked at that picture of things that we need for red blood cells, I talked about iron, but I neglected to talk about the vitamins that we need. We need certain vitamins, specifically those B vitamins, niacin, um, to grow red blood cells. So this is pernicious anemia is telling you the cause of this person's low red blood cell count is they don't have good vitamin intake. And this is not just something like um, I don't take a multivitamin and I don't eat very healthy, so I probably have pernicious anemia. That's pretty rare. Your body does a great job of compensating, even if you're not giving it a whole lot of fuel to work with. It's more likely that we'd see pernicious anemia in the patient who is an alcoholic, where the only thing they do is drink alcohol. And to get around that, can you think of a way we'd fix it? What if we have a population that we say, hey, alcoholics are going to continue to drink alcohol. We've tried to intervene and with behavior modification, but they still continue to drink it. So they end up with anemia because they don't get vitamins. So what do you think we could add to the alcohol that we know alcoholics will buy? Well, they take some of those really cheap liquors and they add vitamins to them. So they're saying um, maybe we can get them to drink their vitamins. It doesn't fix the problem. It definitely treats the condition. Uh, pernicious anemia might be seen in patients who are anorexic or bulimic. So if I'm always throwing my food up and I never let my body break it down and absorb those nutrients, I could end up with pernicious anemia, a low red blood cell count because of that.
if I have um, Crohn's disease or irritable bowel disease where I have maybe I eat and then I just have diarrhea all the time my food is not staying in my intestines long enough to be absorbed so if I have problems with maybe I've had a surgery and I've had a lot of my colon removed people who've had stomach stapling are at risk for this type of anemia so they take B vitamins usually in shot form is one way if they've had problems with pernicious anemia. Hypochromic. So do you remember it was the iron that gave a red blood cell its color and chromic that kind of refers to the color piece. So these red blood cells would be more pale and you could actually collect them in a test tube and they look more white instead of more red. Hypochromic anemia is due to a lack of iron. Um, and we said usually that's pretty rare because the body's just recycling red blood cells but if the person had lost it due to blood and didn't wasn't able to recycle the iron they could have hypochromic anemia what are some complications of anemia so what do you think would happen to a patient's energy level if they had a low red blood cell count and why do you think that would happen so I hope that you can kind of think through if red blood cells carry oxygen and that's their main job and if I don't get oxygen to my cells I'm not gonna have much energy so while I'm not delivering oxygen that's why my energy level would go down what would happen to the patient's color well we go back to hypochromia and I said the blood cells appear more pale well the person's skin would appear more pale what would indicate an appropriate body response to anemia so if I have low red blood cell count my color change is not just because I don't have the iron piece it's just that I don't have enough blood cells in general what would indicate an appropriate body response to an anemia my bone marrow should start to produce more I should have a little bit of hypoxemia especially to my kidneys that would re release that erythropoietin so I'd like to see some reticulocyte action when I do a lab test at what levels do we consider blood transfusion and I talked to you and I said most facilities are going to use a hemoglobin of 8 grams per deciliter or 6 grams per deciliter something less than that and the value of the reticulocyte count would be to see if your body can make reticulocytes then our epoetin treatment is working or your bone marrow is at least still capable of responding um, because of your own hormone being released from the kidneys now that kind of brings up an interesting thing I hadn't mentioned to you in the lecture on white blood cells just like we can grow new red blood cells by giving you erythropoietin and having your bone marrow make it do you imagine because of that there were some scientists that looked at white blood cells and they said there's got to be something in the body that releases or that causes the trigger of white blood cells and they found some stuff called uh, granulocyte colony stimulating factor so we shorten that to its initials GCSF granulocyte colony stimulating factor and it makes a person grow more white blood cells so there's a commercial on TV and this one is for the red blood cell um, erythropoietin drug it shows a lady who's had her cancer treatments and she said I was so tired after my cancer treatments that I couldn't run after you know my grandkids I had little energy and so my doctor gave me these magical shots and I feel so much better well those shots were red blood cells if I'm having cancer treatment and my white blood cell count is low and my bone marrow is still capable of working we give you erythropoietin um, that those erythropo excuse me those granulocyte colony stimulating factor shots are given usually into the belly and that person would complain of deep bone pain as their body is making white blood cells so GCSF we can make the bone marrow make white blood cells we can give erythropoietin to make your body give red blood cells if we give you erythropoietin we also are giving you iron so those two would be pretty commonly given together okay reticulocytes were immature red blood cells I'll give you just a minute to read this it's just kind of a review of what we've talked about I'm not going to put something on the quiz that says what was the dye that they use when they're doing a reticulocyte count but it does explain why if we have a patient who's getting erythropoietin they're going to do a reticulocyte count 
if we have a patient who has anemia, they may do a reticulocyte count to see, is that bone marrow working? Is the body trying to fix the problem itself? Polycythemia, the opposite of anemia, now we have too many red blood cells. And if we go back to that chart, the thing that would make the bone marrow produce more red blood cells would be low oxygen. So can you think of a patient population that would have more erythropoietin released? Well, it was low oxygen. And those would be patients who have emphysema or chronic bronchitis, and we sometimes call them COPDers, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients. I imagine if you had severe enough asthma that was persistent, you could have a low oxygen. Uh, if you have low red blood cells in general, you have low oxygen, but your body probably can't produce enough, I, 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 and that's what happens is your body will produce more red blood cells. Do you remember when we went to high altitude, your body will produce more red blood cells? Probably not if I stay there only two days, but think about the people who climb the Himalayas. Um, they go and they use different base camps and they're spending time at each one to give their body enough time to kind of produce some more red blood cells to compensate for that lower pressure of oxygen. This is called secondary polycythemia. Secondary polycythemia it occurred in response to something else and that something else that caused it was low oxygen. For whatever mechanism, because of a pulmonary disease or your heart doesn't pump your blood around fast enough, it's called secondary polycythemia. There's also a type of polycythemia called primary polycythemia or polycythemia vera, or it's also called polycythemia rubra vera. I've seen those terms in patients' charts. So if you'll look at this one, specifically the second bulleted item, it's pretty rare. We do see polycythemia pretty common, but it's usually secondary polycythemia, the one that's in lung patients. So this one might make us think, do you have a type of leukemia where your body's producing too many red blood cells? Because it's a problem with the bone marrow not knowing when to shut off, and it actually overproduces all three blood cell lines, the white blood cells, the red blood cells, and the platelets. All those are produced by the bone marrow, and we call those the blood cell lines. Okay, so a quick review on polycythemia. It was an overproduction of red blood cells. The most common type of polycythemia is secondary polycythemia. What do you think would happen to the, the consistency of the blood if you have polycythemia? So what do you think happens to the hematocrit level? Well, if I produce more red blood cells, that's more solids. Crit was solids to liquids. Higher number on the top of the mathematical ratio, my crit goes up. So I have more solids, my crit goes up what would the consistency of my blood be like if it has more solids compared to liquids in it? It starts to become thicker. And ca as you can imagine, that makes the heart work harder. And that's in patients who a lot of times already have damage to their heart, so that's the last thing we need. So how could you get rid of some of those red blood cells? Well, the way I get rid of some red blood cells in a um, normal way as I go donate blood. So guess what we have our patients do? We don't have them go, go, go donate blood. We take off some red blood cells. That's one way. Now, if we just continue to do that, though, we're treating the symptoms. We're not treating the cause. If most polycythemia is because of hypoxemia, the thing we need to do is put the patient on oxygen. So oxygen is usually the treatment for the most common type of polycythemia, which is secondary polycythemia, secondary to low oxygen, give them oxygen. The other thing we could do is we just have someone, um, it's not going to work just to have them drink more fluids, is it? Because that will just dilute the blood down, it would make it thinner, but it means their heart's still going to have to work harder to now pump all of the extra fluid that we've put in it. So we need to get rid of red blood cells and put you on oxygen so your bone marrow doesn't release more. And which type, I guess, the type that would benefit is not primary polycythemia, it would be secondary polycythemia. Okay, those red blood cell indices, they're going to be helpful in identifying the cause or type of anemia. So if I had red blood cells that didn't have enough iron on them, 
you could imagine my mean cell hemoglobin concentration and my mean cell hemoglobin counts would be low. So if I have these low, it tells me a little bit about, hey, it doesn't have enough hemoglobin on it. Maybe the cell's the right size, this distribution width is okay, but the cell doesn't have enough hemoglobin on it. Maybe the, si the cell size is too big or is too small. So we'll look at some of these. If our mean cell is lower than normal, we call it microcytic. Your cells are too small. If your mean cell volume is greater than normal, we call it macrocytic. If your hemo counts, hemoglobin counts low, we call it hyperchromic. So look at that. We could already identify, hey, the cause of your anemia is you need some more iron. Let's give it to you, either an IV form or pill form. The cause of your anemia is your cells are too small. Let's look at what you're lacking. Maybe you need some B vitamins or something to grow those. So here's a patient who has a low red blood cell count. We're going to see that low hemoglobin, low crit to go with it. We're going to come down here and see if we can identify the cause of their anemia. It looks like their hemoglobin count is normal. It's actually a little bit high. So I wouldn't say, oh, it's iron deficiency or hypochromic anemia because their hemoglobin count is okay this mean hemoglobin amount on each cell is okay. Uh, their red cell distribution width, their cells are actually beefier than they should be. They're big. Maybe they're getting broken down more. Maybe that could be a cause of the anemia. And the last thing, so you know you're to the end, is called erythrocyte sedimentation rate. And if you think about this name, an erythrocyte is a red blood cell. Sediment is settling. So how fast do red blood cells settle out? So they take a tube that's filled with whole blood, anticoagulated blood, and it's going to separate kind of like that test tube I showed you at the beginning of class. It's going to separate into the solids and the liquids. And they're going to look at how quickly do the red blood cells settle out. Well, red blood cells fall. They're supposed to fall or settle out at a specific rate. But when red blood cells have inflammation or there's um, infection present, guess what happens? They become more sticky. So even though white blood cells are the cells fighting the infection, red blood cells can kind of give us an indicator of inflammation or infection. So if there's inflammation or infection in the body, the red blood cells become stickier. And can you imagine if I join with five other red blood cells, we're going to settle out quicker than one blood cell all by itself. So the more that we clump together, even though we've been anticoagulated, the more we kind of stick together, the quicker we fall out. So measurement of the sedimentation rate is useless if we do it just by itself. It's going to be in combination with symptoms. There's certain conditions we might use it with. So what does it mean if they have an increased sed rate? It meant the red blood cells settled out quicker. And an increased sed rate means increased inflammation or infection in the body. We might use the sed rate in a patient who has arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic condition. That patient would typically be given some sort of steroid or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that they take. And so the doctor might say, once a month for a while, I want you to come in and we're going to do a sed rate. If your sed rate's high, we don't have you on enough medication, right? Because arthritis has an inflammatory piece to it. And so we'd like to see that number come back to its normal range if your treatment's working correctly. Similarly, if a patient had an infection like pneumonia or tuberculosis, that would cause an increased sed rate. So an increased sed rate combined with an increased white blood cell count tells us there's inflammation or infection. Okay, one last thing then. Patient has, let's see what else we use that with. If they have lupus, lupus is a chronic inflammatory condition. It's one where the body kind of has an immune reaction to itself. If you have lupus, we give you anti-inflammatory drugs. So what if your sed count is really, really low? Well, maybe we could back off on your medications a little bit. If your sed count was really high, then we know we need to give you more of those anti-inflammatory medications. Okay, that's it. If you have any questions, you're always welcome to call me. And remember, you have two attempts on your quizzes. You should be able to click on your score of quiz, quiz one on Monday. I'll open it back up.
so that you can see uh, what you got on your quiz and what were the right answers. So each Monday I'll try and remember to change the settings on the quizzes so your score becomes a clickable link. If you have questions, you're welcome to post them on the discussion board so that all students can see the answer. Thank you very much.